Mark would introduce people, but uh, Mark's at last seminar said, I'll be out of town, so can you introduce yourself? And I'm like, okay. Um, but hi, my name is Nancy Gorey. Today we're going to talk about focus concept inventories to assess both core skills and common misconceptions that students have in genetics. I probably should have put genetics in there somewhere. So to introduce myself, since it seems I'm introducing myself, um, I have a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry from Warburg. I know um, Larry might cringe a little because he's from Luther, but mine's from Warburg. Um, I have a master's degree in medical micro and immunology from Madison. And I have a doctorate in uh, molecular cellular developmental biology from ISU, which uh, kind of means I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, my course is taught. I teach 80% of the time, which is leaves 20% for research. Um, and if you kind of add all the both the course credits and the student numbers up together, my student credit hours per, per full-time faculty equivalent is roughly 700 in the spring and 11, uh, uh, roughly 1,000 in the fall. And the average for, it, for the College of Ag and Life Sciences student credit hour per faculty, full-time equivalent is 300. So, yeah, I'm teaching a lot. So, what I'm doing in the research part, so the 80% teaching that's, you know, keeps me pretty busy, but what about the research part? The research I do is called Discipline-Based Education Research, and it is aimed at deepening and broadening the uh, education systems that we have, the foundations of teaching practice. How do we teach these topics? And it is, it's the interface between education research, which is focused on the education side of things, and the discipline, where you need the expertise in genetics, in <coughs> microbiology, in chemistry, or whatever the discipline is. That's why it's called discipline-based, not chemistry-based, and so on. It's going to meet similar standards to any type of scholarship. So it needs to be evidence-based. We need to have a core that's in, in the literature to avoid duplications, look for methods that are going to work, and reach out to collaborators. We're also going to be evidence-generating, and that's some of the things we're going to be looking at today. Your experimental design should actually generate information, and statistics in this case, if you're going to be doing classroom research, you're edging into the social sciences, and so your statistics need to be very uh, on point for what assumptions you can make and not make about classrooms and about your study design. And then you need to disseminate and publish your work. So the plan for today is, you know, first of all, why should we care? You're all here because uh, Mark set out a, a announcement that said, hey, we're going to talk about concept inventories. So why, why would we even bother with this? So we're going to look at um, two foundational reports, <coughs> Vision and Change and the Freeman Report. Then we're going to look at why am I bothering with mutations? There's a lot of different things we can do a concept inventory on, and why are we bothering with mutations? And then what is a concept inventory? Because I'm using this word, what does it mean? We'll look at that. And then how did this concept inventory construction, and the concept inventory in question is very nearly done. We're in the process of writing up the results uh, for publication. And we're going to look at some of those findings as to what misconceptions did students had and how those misconceptions were resolving over the course of the semester that we tested the concept inventory in. And then we'll look at future directions. So, the one thing I did want to mention is, as I'm talking, if you have a question that comes to mind, I love being interrupted. Please do interrupt me. And I know that this is not the type of research that a lot of times a plant pathology department is going to be seeing. So if I'm using words and I'm doing things that I are a little different, that are jargony on my side of the, the bench here, please raise your hand and say, what on earth are you talking about? Okay, I'm good with that. So. Let's talk about the call for change. In 2007, which seems like it was just yesterday, but it was quite a while ago, um, the AAAS and the National Science Foundation published a paper, and it's actually a, a very large document, 
um, called Vision and Change in Undergraduate Biology Education, A Call to Action. And it established core concepts and competencies that biology should encompass. If you're going to teach biology, and by biology they mean microbiology, they mean genetics, they mean plant pathology, they mean um, general biology as well. It's not good enough to teach the way we've been taught. That was really the foundational statement here. Okay, and these are the learning objectives, and I know this is really, really small print. Um, I wanted to put them all out there in case anybody was interested in what vision and change really had to say, but the six core concepts really are evolution, structure function, uh, information flow, um, transformation of energy, so metabolism, and then systems, okay? And then the core competencies of which one is, the, the sixth one is often people will say is the scientific literacy piece. So biologically literate and the practice of science and the nature of science. The ones that I have highlighted here are the ones where the information flow, exchange, and storage are on point to the mutations concept inventory. So this is why, one of the reasons why we chose to do the mutations concept inventory. Okay, so why do we do active learning? And I was going to do this great presentation and have you guys have all clickers. My clicker software no longer works because I took one too many updates with my computer, which I'm a little sad with. Um, but why do we do active learning? In 2014, uh, Scott Freeman and, and et al. published a report about active learning. Okay, so let's talk about traditional lecture. Traditional lecture is 800 years old, and it is state-of-the-art educational practice if this was 1300, okay? It arose during a time where you had a book, and nobody else had that book because books were really precious and rare, so in order to learn anything, this person dictated from the book and everybody else wrote down what they dictated, they literally read from the book, okay? So let's fast forward a couple hundred years. This is a classroom in the 1940s. You're like, ah, not a lot of difference, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a classroom in the 2000s, okay? Not a lot of difference. So lecture is a very uh, <coughs> kind of much maligned way of teaching but the Freeman group actually did a meta-analysis of several different papers. They grabbed 225 published results in STEM classrooms about how teaching was done and what learning was going on in these classrooms. So they looked at two variables, exam performance as reported in these 225 reports and the failure rate of students. They looked at 67 of those courses of the 225 were lecture-based, and then 158 were active learning courses. So they compared these two groups. So if we look at the data, and we're working today, if we look at the data, here is the percent of students who fail the class if it's lecture, and we have, we're uh, edging up to the six, 50, 60, 70, 80, and if it's active. And if we look at that, on average, the traditional lecture students are approximately one and a half times more likely to fail than students that are taking a class that utilizes active learning mechanisms. Right? And the active learning improves grades. So if we look at the 50th percentile student in a traditional lecture class, and you compare this statistically with the active learning classes, using the data that I just showed as a model, it showed that about 68, that, that 50th percentile would turn into the 68th percentile, okay? And if, you know, this is, when, I'm, when I do active learning in classrooms, this is one of the slides I show the students because they're like, yeah, that's great, that's wonderful, but it gives me an average of 6% average examination score and a .3 GPA score, like, and so on. So this is this is kind of the money piece to this when you're trying to sell active learning to a classroom that might want to just sit and not be doing active learning because that never happens. Okay. 
the quote that I both heard in a talk earlier this year, and I pulled out of the paper because I really was completely flummoxed by it when I <coughs> saw it. If experiments analyzed here had been conducted as randomized controlled trials of medical interventions, they may have been stopped for benefit, meaning enrolling patients in the control condition, lecture, might have been discontinued because the treatment being tested was clearly more beneficial. That's the, oh my goodness, okay. So active learning is good. That's what Steve Freeman says, that's what Vision and Chase says, but are all active learning techniques equal? Right? There's a lot of things that are active learning. Are all techniques going to equally lead to student learning? Okay, one way we need to do this is we need to be able to determine whether students meet their learning outcomes. So when you build a class, the first thing you should be doing is defining what that class is going to entail. What are the learning outcomes? At the end of this class, what do these students need to be able to do? Then we're going to provide learning opportunities. That's teaching the class. And then assess the, the students based on those learning outcomes and then redesign based on the data that you got from here. This is the piece that our group is working on here. How do we accurately assess whether these learning outcomes have been made? Okay. So how do we get learning outcomes from a national level? Well, the American Society for Microbiology and the Genetic Society of America and Vision and Change all are giving us certain versions of learning outcomes. So we have national calls to be doing things. We also have concept inventories for genetics, like all of genetics has a concept inventory. Physics, there's a forced concept inventory. There are chemistry concept inventories. What we were doing is taking all of genetics and breaking it down into smaller pieces and looking at things like mutations, pedigrees, epistasis, epigenetics, and complex inheritance, or actually the five concept inventories we've promised NSF that we were going to do. Why are, we doing, why are we breaking this into small pieces? Well, the genetics concept inventory starts, <coughs> you, you, you can give it at the very beginning of the class, and you give it at the very end of the class, and you don't really have a lot of room to steer the ship if you're giving it at the very end of the class. If you're doing something like, I'm going to change how I taught mutations this year. Do I know if how I taught mutations is going to be part of that very large uh, genetics concept inventory? Or do I want something that's going to say, does the way I'm teaching mutations this year is an improvement over last year? Or did I just change for change's sake? Because that sometimes happens. OK, so what is a concept inventory? I'm surprised nobody's asked me that yet. OK, so yeah, well, I told you to ask. <laughs> OK, so it must be something valued by instruction. So you need to give as a pretest, as a post-test, to serve, to see learning gains. Here's, I still haven't defined what it is. You must have something that's simple and easy to grade. This means it's usually multiple choice, okay? And you need to have concepts that are established that are, you have the conceptual, what is it we think they're going to learn, and then you build learning out outcomes based on those concepts. And then you build questions based on those learning outcomes and then convert them into multiple choice. And we'll show, I'll, I'll take you step by step how this is done. Okay, um, the faculty must agree on the most important concepts. We have kind of a national level agreement, but we want some kind of a boots on the ground, who's teaching these classes, what are these things that you're teaching, or, what are, or is it, are we picking topics that are not commonly taught? And so, as we're doing this, we get input from the stakeholders throughout. Okay. And then the test must actually measure what it claims to measure. Okay. We need to make sure that it's both valid and reliable. And we'll look at validity and reliability measures here in a second. So conducting any type of research relies on high quality instrumentation available to measure the system under investigation. And this was actually from a chemist. He happened to be publishing it in the Journal of Chemical Education, but it's from a chemist. Okay. 
So how do we do this? And this is, there's a lot of things going on here. So you determine the learning objectives. We have what is it we want them to learn? So you look into the literature, you develop your learning objectives, you get, fact, you get feedback from the faculty. You then develop questions, you develop open-ended questions, you get feedback from the faculty, do these questions match with what, how you're teaching it? You test with students and you do it after the class is completed. We want to know what the students understand after they're done with a course. And the, we then review and revise and identify <coughs> common errors that are happening if there were some clarity issues. Um, we also gather that data and we're going to look at that data much more carefully <coughs> to then develop multiple choice distractors using common wrong answers as the wrong answers on your multiple choice. So this isn't the faculty saying, oh, I think they'll get it wrong if I steer them this way. We're taking the students' responses, and this is what the students were thinking, and this is these are the most common things that they were thinking wrongly, and we're going to craft them into distractors that will then address it in a multiple choice format. We could just stop here. But remember, one of, the one of the things with the concept inventory is it has to be easy to use. And multiple choice is much easier to grade than coding hundreds of responses. Okay, And then we do the calculate the statistics. We'll review, revise, and then you test pre and post for the final set of validation data. This is approximately a two-year process. So just because of the number of times you need to encounter students and you need to pre-test and post-test and you need institutional um, IRB approval every time you are using the students as data sources. So this is a fairly extensive process. Okay. This project was funded by an Innovations in Undergraduate STEM Education, or IU's NSF grant. Um, I'm the, the lead principal investigator, and uh, this is done work done in conjunction with Becky seipelt Thiemann in, at Middle Tennessee State University. So we have two different institutions with multiple graduate students working on this project. Okay, so why do we care about mutations? Okay, well, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this cartoon. I'm hungry and cold and stressed and everything is awful. You might need to flip your switch. Mutations, speed up evolution. Okay, warning, emergency use only. And here's a CRISPR-Cas and, you know, my job is to prevent cancer. Mutation, uh, whatever. Okay, so. Why do we care about mutations? Well, we use mutations a lot as scientists. Just as the day-to-day -day life of a scientist, we're using a lot of things. The other reason we care about mutations, remember vision and change not only had core conceptual things they wanted us to know, or our students to know, but they also wanted science literacy. The public has a lot of ideas about mutations, like GMOs and designer babies, and you know, this is actually very topical with movies coming out this weekend. The yeah. X-Men. Yay. Yay. Okay. <coughs> so just to walk you through the process, we establishing learning objectives for mutations. Here is the Genetic Society of, of America's list of what they want someone to know if they're going to be looking at mutations. And here's the list, and I know it's really small print, but it's I just, it, it, the point here is they have given a list and it's going to be part of the professional organization. The other part of this data set is we ask for faculty input from the trenches. We want to know what people are going to be teaching. So it's not just what the national organization says, it's what other people are doing. So the learning objectives were as follows. The first thing, and this sounds really basic, but trust me when you see the data, what is a mutation? Can the students define what a mutation is? And then differentiate between somatic and germline mutations and predict the inheritance patterns. And then differentiate between loss of function and gain of function mutations. The last one here, predict the nature of changes of DNA exposed to intercalating agents, base analogs, and radiation. This is in the, the data for the, the mutations concept inventory, but when we did the pre and post test, we found that about a third of our faculty never teach this. 
So this is one that's going to be the, the fifth, number five is optional. Okay, so if we're going to do this, remember, first thing we got to do is, here's my learning objective, what's my question? So here's the question we built. Renal cell carcinomas are associated with the translocation of chromosome three, which they are. So an, an error occurs in the development of a kidney from stem cells, which is mitosis. It leads to this chromosome three translocation. This causes a cluster of cancer cells to form in this man's right kidney. If this individual were to have children, would his kids have kidney cancer too? And assuming that he had kids after he had cancer, why or why not? This was an open-ended question. So I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular, but what do you think? What's going on here? Is this a somatic or a germline mutation? Somatic. 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 I, I swear, I had my clickers <coughs> at the ready, and the software did not work. So yes, this is a somatic mutation. Now, the million dollar question, did the students know that one? Okay. No, because this is an error that occurred in the somatic cell. That's the correct answer. But we got lots of other answers, too. Okay. No, my no mitosis does not deal with the development of the embryo. We are all zygotes sitting here. <laughs> okay. Yes, because the mRNA would be translated through his DNA, would be transcribed into his sex cells, this would cause his, his children to have the mutation. Now, when we're coding these responses, this is a good example of magical thinking. <laughs> because they, have, they, they come up with an elaborate explanation for what they, 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 they settle on an answer, and then they have an elaborate explanation that has no basis in reality. So, and oh, this is a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be, but that's okay. So this is, this is kind of the example of things we pulled out. If you did this with 400 data points, which is what we did, 390 data points, 55% in a post-test got this right, which is actually not a horrible, horrible thing. 15% um, was vague, things like, yes, because it's causing a new type. I, I, I don't know what to do with that. Okay, uh, mutation is any change was a really popular answer here. Uh, even though he was not directly affecting the genetic code and is not heritable, it does not a der derivation from the code he would have been, thus mutates the message that was supposed to be transcribed. Okay, 400 of these, these, just, just, okay. So, <laughs> mutation is any change, very, very popular. Okay, anthropomorphic. Uh, yes, the protein is being changed from what the DNA initially intended it to be, because DNA has intent. Um, confusion about central dogma? Yes, if this protein would be translated back into DNA. Okay. Um, and then unrecognizable due to multiple errors. Yes, because an extra amino acid has appeared, altering the overall DNA sequence, generating a novel chromosome. I, I don't even have words for that. These were your students, were they? What? These were your students. Uh, no, these were, not, well, they might have been. <laughs> probably, actually, probably not, because this was spring 19 data. So yes, I, I'm free and clear on this one. <laughs> Unless, of course, it might have been the freshman. No, because I don't teach the freshman class. So yeah, I think I'm free and clear on, on this set. The other one, eh, not so much. Yeah. So what, do you, what software are you using to add to the response? Uh, we are actually doing this because we have four people doing this actually six people doing this, we're uh, using Excel to do this by hand, this step, step by step. We thought about doing in vivo, but we're, we're because, here, let's go back, because, oh, okay. because these responses are so wildly uh, unpredictable, um, I started, I started looking at in vivo, and it, what it gave me the first run was something that I had to go back and do this again. And if I'm going to have to do it again, I might as well just do it by hand to start with. And I would love to have Invivo actually work for me because this is very labor intensive. Just saying. Um, and as Chloe and Nick are both the idea of. <coughs> okay, so reading about 400 responses to identify these common themes. Um, and then we generate misconception codes for all of these. 
we tally these, which we just saw, the kind of the, the percentages, and we use the most common ones as then distractors for the multiple choice. So here is, like, you were asking how we did this. This is an Excel um, document. So this was mistaking central dogma for gametogenesis, referring to dominance, and so this would then be the codes. It's, it's something in central dogma. This one's Mendelian inheritance. And then the other idea that his kidney genes and um, this idea that not all genes are in all cells, that there's actually genes that are just in the kidneys, that was somewhat common throughout. Um, and then determining heritability by uh, probability, not genotype. So it might just depend on maybe. Okay. So the multiple choice version. So Renal said it's the same question. So we have the no, his children would not likely have kidney cancer. Yes, his children would likely have kidney cancer because the mutation is dominant. No, his children would not likely have kidney cancer because the mutation is on an autosome, not a sex chromosome. That was a very common problem. They conflate the idea of sex chromosome and gamete and autosome and somatic cell. And so they think that the gametes only have sex chromosomes and the somatic cells only have autosomes. But when you ask them how many chromosomes does a egg or a sperm have, they'll say 23. And I'm like, so they're all just copies of X's and Y's? And at that point, usually it kind of clicks, but not always. Um, but there's, there's a big population that really conflates that. Um, and then his children would likely have kidney cancer because all mutations are passed to the next generation. That gets at that idea of can you differentiate somatic from germline? And then it's un it, it cannot be determined due to limited information. The mother's genotype we know. That's getting at the idea that they're invoking Mendelian inheritance. We just don't know because we don't know who mom is. Okay, so now we need to test if this is actually valid. And by validity we mean is it measuring expert-like thinking? And is it reliable? Is it going to be reliable in multiple <coughs> contexts? So, Recruit faculty, ah. Oh. So the Society for the Advancement of Biological Education Research, AKA SABER, and American Society for Microbiology Biology Scholars are both two nation nationwide institutions that have a lot of biology education researchers that are teaching a lot of genetics and microbiology and general biology courses. So I put out a call to both of these groups and I got different schools to say, sure, we'd love to write an IRB for our school and work with you and do this. Um, so we had public, private schools, R1, R3. Um, we had community colleges, and each of these had to do an IRB, which uh, it, with some schools it wasn't a big deal, some schools it was kind of a problem. Um, and then they administered this pre and post. This was <coughs> in the fall of 2018. And we ran the statistics for both validity and reliability. And I'll get to what that looks like here in a second. Okay, the keep your fingers crossed because again, at this point, we're 18 months in and we're testing for reliability and validity right here. Okay, so <coughs> did the students learn? Let me keep you waiting on this. Okay, performance pre versus post. The pre, which was given week one, and the post, which was given week 15, this is the averages, and as much as I love these spider diagrams, they do not allow for error bars, so we'll get to the, the significant differences here in a second. But you can see from here, which are in the defined mutation category, students didn't really improve a lot. Um, there's questions two and six that looked pretty good, seven looks pretty good as well. And when we did the, ran the, just the initial summary stats, the significant differences actually were in two, three, six and seven, and then 10. So this is not, this is not a measure of validity or a reliability. This is just a measure of where were the students learning. We'll get to whether or not the questions were actually valid to, to determine that. But to look at this, we've got several subjects or several questions where, yes, they did make statistically significant gains in their understanding based on these questions. Now we need to dig a little deeper. 
today. How do we actually measure learning gains? Because if you have a question where you have someone who, or the average was 80% correct, if that class got up to 90%, that's a very different situation than if 40% got it correct and they went up to 50%. So we need to normalize those learning gains. And so to do that, we divide, the, the equation to do this is to take into account the amount that they could have learned, so by doing post minus pre, and then you divide it by 100% minus the pre. So of what they could have learned, did they learn? And so this is the formula. If anybody ever wants to calculate normalized learning gains, here it is. And these are done by class. This is not done by individual student. You don't calculate one student to the next. You calculate this is how the classes did, like each class. Now if I broke it into each institution, which I intentionally did not do because it's kind of mean to break the data up and say, oh, this teacher in this classroom did worse than this other one. I did actually break the data up and give it to each individual teacher, but it never went to administration and it would never go any further than that because it's for their course improvement, not for anybody to use as a weapon against them. Because this is actually one of the reasons why when you collaborate with some of this research, people are a little sometimes skittish to do it because there is a potential for people to make those comparisons. So this is the entire data set of all the classrooms across seven different institutions. And we can see that some of the questions they made great gains on when you normalize for the amount that they could have learned, and some not so much. Now, if I'm teaching a class and I see this, I can then look at this and go, well, okay, question four was a defining mutations and looking at, and I'm actually gonna cheat because I don't remember which one question four was. Shockingly, I don't have it memorized. Um, so four was a part of the looking at the codon table and can you read the codon table and tell me what it's going to do, right? And so if I'm seeing this, I'm saying, you know, maybe, they, maybe we need to spend some more time reading the codon table, right? And this one here, question one, this was, I told you we got kind of tricky on the defined mutations. If a ribosome slips, and adds an amino acid to the protein, is that a mutation? What do you think? Is it inherited? No, the ribosome just slipped. No. Is it inherited? <laughs> you, you nailed the, the, the key question there, Roger. <laughs> it is not inherited. So it would, it would change the protein, right. but it wouldn't change the mRNA, wouldn't change the DNA. Is it a somatic mutation? Wouldn't it be? If it's only did once, I don't even know that it would even register that because it wouldn't. Oh, it's only it's, slipped one time. It only slipped one time. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Well, this is a concept. Just go on. Yeah. Okay. This is a concept that pre thirty percent got right and post forty uh, percent got right. So that's something that we you know that that just if you're going to talk about mutations in a real deep way, the fact that they're really a little fuzzy on the definitions. That's a, that's a really good talking point. So, okay, so what to do with this? Well, identifying problems, defining mutations, right? So, if ribosome slips on this and, it, and causes this to appear, causing an extra amino acid to appear, only 38% got this right in week 15 of a genetics course, okay? Um, characterizing point mutations, if codon 3 is changed from UAC to U U UAA, what's the effect on the protein? Um, only 40% got it correct in post. Uh, this is a nonsense mutation, and the reason that there was a lot of people that got this one wrong is because it was pretty much a 50-50 split. Does a stop codon stop transcription or translation? So. This is something, again, students struggle with. They can tell you the verbiage, it's a stop coda. But, you know, this is where you probe a little deeper. What is it? And then this identifying problems with somatic and this, only 54% on the multiple choice version got it right. 
which actually kind of matches with the 55% on the open-ended one, which I was like pretty happy with that happening. Okay, so taking that deeper look, okay, if a 20% gain in the correct answers, that means 20% somewhere in that population moved from an incorrect answer to a correct answer. And we can see this in this way. This is actually question two. If we change the DNA sequence of a promoter, not the coding region, in the promoter, that's going to lead to an overexpression. That is a mutation, but it really, the, there's this, mutations are only in co coding region is a common problem. And this error in cause effect reasoning, there were several students who stated that the overexpression would cause the DNA to change. So. Uh, I'm a little flummoxed by that. So this is a, a uh, plant pathology. Thought I would put a heat map up. <laughs> You're a hard <laughs> Okay. So here's our in increases, and these are just the questions where we had a statistically significant increase. So I, I kind of cherry picked a little bit, but where we can see these are changing. So 20% more. We have an improvement here. And they're no longer or uh, re reducing their functioning, thinking that functioning is really the criteria of whether it's a mutation or not. And this, the one that also makes me really happy, they're uh, almost 11% are improvement in that idea of cause-effect reasoning. They have this real sticking point of DNA RNA protein, and sometimes they will think that the protein changes are going to somehow and again, that with that magical thinking, going to be reflected back in the DNA. If all we've done is change the protein, there's, there's no mechanism for that. But just because there's no mechanism for that, doesn't mean they aren't going to make one up. And they do. Um, and then, so we categorize the changes in the DNA. This is basically reading the codon table and being able to tell the difference between a missense and a frame shift. And these, this magical thinking, again, almost 10% kind of shifted into actually getting it right. And by magical thinking on this one, we had a lot of things where they would give a really detailed mechanism, again, that had no basis in reality. Um, and then the last one is the tumor suppressor gene. What is a loss of function mutation? What does that actual term mean? And the improvement of almost 13%. And one of the big pieces that, that persisted is they would relate loss and gain of function to the cell itself, not the protein. So if I have a loss of function in a tumor suppressor cell, or if my tumor suppressor is no longer working, it must be a gain of function because the cell can grow now. That's what their reasoning was. But if, when in a minute you say that the tumor suppressor is no longer working, they should be, that's the loss of function. But they're, they're taking it to the cell, not to the gene that we're looking at and the protein involved. Okay, and then results informally. So somatic and germline is a real struggle. Only 53% correct in the post with a great deal of variability from class to class. Um, this idea of mutation as any change, um, it's closely related to this cause effect reasoning. And it's also this idea of heritability. So when you're talking about mutations, you know, mutations are often talked about in the context of evolution. So that heritability piece is done. I think I've already mentioned that 50% is, they think that the stop codon is stopping transcription. It's kind of a flip of the coin, whether the stop codon st um, stops transcription or translated. And then the central dogma issues, that kind of pervades throughout. So don't assume students, if you have, if you're teaching graduate classes, if you're teaching upper level undergraduate classes, don't assume that they know the central dogma because this data would argue they do not. At least not all. Um, and magical thinking, this idea that they're putting up mechanisms that really don't make a lot of sense. And you know, one way to kind of address that is make them provide a mechanism. If they think this is happening, give me the mechanism by which it could happen. And then if that mechanism doesn't make any sense, ask how could that nonsensical mechanism, you know, give you know, push that, that mechanism button a lot. You know, well, how does that work? And how does that work? <coughs> you know, the idea of turtles all the way down. Question, question, question. Okay, so validation data, and I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna.
So wasn't this instrument of building, it, it, so the Chromebox Alpha, otherwise known as KR20, um, this is a measure of how cohesive the instrument is question by question and then taking each piece and then the sum of its parts. And if it's over 5, it's acceptable, or 0.5. If it's over 0.7, it's considered a strong one. The KR20 for this is 0.71. Item discrimination differentiates between how well does each of these items differentiate between high performing students and low performing students. So they separate the class into quartiles, and does the first quartile get this question better, more, more frequently than the lowest quartile? And it's question by question. And Point three, or, um, point three or better is optimal in our item discrimination. We only have one that's at a point three. Um, and then point by serial, above zero is considered okay. If you can get them above point two, it's optimal. And all but that one is optimal. Um, let's see, work in progress. We're looking at the demographic statistics. Um, we want to look at the normalized learning gain. And to see what the effect size is, does it matter what kind of school you're taking, you're, you're taking this course in? Does it matter um, male, female? Is there a difference between males and females? Is there a difference uh, first generation status? Is there a difference with ethnicity or grade level? Um, the initial data that I ran on the spring 18 data showed only English as a second language had an effect on, a, a statistically significant effect on the total scores for this but we have not done the, the follow-up data on that yet. And then cross tabs per question, how many students learned? And this is like a great, this is, okay, question two, pre, there's students either got a zero or a one, and post, they either got a zero or a one. So this group got a zero and a zero. So we call these the learning resistant, okay? We have the ones that got it right in the pre, but got it wrong in the post. Those are the lucky guessers. <laughs> um, we have the ones that got it right pre, but they also got it right post. That's prior knowledge. And the one that we're really excited about as teachers, the ones that got it wrong in the pre, but got it right in the post. So we're looking at where learning's occurring. And so we can make some comparisons that way. So, and basically, Future work, we promised uh, in this grant, we promised uh, several other concept inventories. Pedigrees is in the same place mutations is. Uh, epistasis and epigenetics, uh, polygenic inheritance, and Hardy-Weinberg. We, we only promised them five, but we'll probably do six because they work really well with a double group to do a pair. Because uh, I don't know what I would do if we only had one to work on. So, and then the path is this about, we just fixed misconceptions in their persistence. You know, are there misconceptions that stick from freshman year to senior year and maybe even into graduate school? And then with this data, how can we make more effective targeted interventions? I right? can make some recommendations, but we need to make the, some of those interventions and then test them using this instrument. And as I was walking up, Ed was saying, well, did, have you done this? I'm like, well, fall 18 data. <laughs> so, Okay, and thank you, and our, the ISU team is Chloe, hi Chloe, and Nick, and Patrick Armstrong from um, psychology, and then Becky and her graduate students, and then here's our collaborators where I call, you know, put out for the people. Um, not everybody could participate in the fall 18 data set, um, and then here's the NSF funding. And questions? And I'm four minutes over. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, Nick. Hey, um, so my question is, you said that you were able to normalize the questions at, uh, or the students at Iowa State at R1, community college, at the yeah. colleges. So to me, I'm, I'm thinking like, if you are comparing students in different semesters at Iowa State, I, I would say that's more like apples to apples, but then comparing students at different universities where perhaps the standards to get into a community college versus uh, R1 or 
liberal arts college are different. How do you compare students at different well, universities? That's, you actually put the data into one big pool and you then test the effect size of university against the gains that you have. And you really, for a reliability measure, you hope that there's no difference. And it's, that, that was the, oh please, oh please. Uh, because you want the, whatever instrument you're building here to be useful for the community college teacher, for the R1, for the R3, the small private liberal arts school. And that was actually why you kind of cast a big net to make sure that when you're doing the validity testing, you have representative students from all those classes. And it passed with flying colors. Except for the last, I will say, except for the mutagens one, because there were several schools that just didn't teach it. Yes? So when you show that bar graph with different questions. OK, which one? Um, I don't know. It's about half a few. You know, OK. Well, the the mask is. OK, yeah? Is, is, this one? No. No, a bar graph. Bar graph, bar graph, bar graph, bar graph. One of the questions. Oh. This one? Yeah. This one's actually only one question. Um, well, this is, this go, is. Go back more. Okay, go back to more. Uh, the spider graph? Yeah. No, oh, this one. Yeah, yeah, this is normalized learning means. Okay. Yes. So, and you said you don't compare, at least to the paper, you don't compare uh, amongst schools. Right. There was some variation. So I was wondering what the variability was in those different questions. Because of the nature of the question, could generate variability as well as in school. Right, and that's so why we're looking at, if, I, I, I'm not sure if I quite catch your question, so well, I, if I, the, I don't ask. remember what the questions are now, but right. I saw <laughs> some questions I could think would generate a lot of variability, right. and some would be fairly, oh, but be more standard. Right, and that might be some of this, like the, the this variability we're seeing are changes in student, like, student scores for the whole population. So this is not student by student. When I did the bar graph, where we could see the learning resistant, that's student by student. Um, so what this is really trying to show is, can it differentiate any kind of learning going on? And so that's a different measure than kind of what, uh, what what's the validity of the questions. The validity of the questions is way over here, and this is where we get um, Patrick, who is a psychometrician, that's, yeah, that's a word. Um, like, psychometrics expert, and he's the one that did all of the statistics on this because this is kind of, that's the type of instrumentation he built. He does not know anything about genetics, and he was perplexed as to what a gel doc was at one point. But he's really good at this kind of stuff. <laughs> so, um, other questions? Unless I, I, I if I haven't answered your, uh, um, No, I, I was just wondering as you were talking. No, oh, no, that's why you're supposed to ask questions. Interrupt me. I never talk for 50 minutes that. straight. This is weird for me. <laughs> no. All right. So, so yeah. just yeah, the practicality of uh, <laughs> what, what's the approach there? I mean, if you give them problems and have a small group work together, does does a lot of peer teaching go on to kind of work some of that out? I, I have been working towards some of that. Um, one of my classes, I'm doing a lot more team-based learning, so the students are working through it. Um, but it is always pressing that mechanism button because if they, if they, if you press it enough, they will either uncover where they're going horribly awry, or they'll dig their hole really, really deep, and somebody else will kind of bring them back. Yeah. If, you, if you do it in a small group. Yeah. Because if, if it's kind of uh, that extension of ridiculousness, after a certain point, you're like, well, now how did that actually happen? And when they have to say, I don't know, then you can back them up and go, well, what do we know and how do you yeah. go back? They can do that with each other in yeah, a they can less do that. threatening way. Yeah, exactly. So it's not, you know, how dare you say that? <laughs> so, yeah. And it, it, it does actually work pretty well in small groups of about four to five. Um, but I won't know how well. Because again, I have, I, we still have data that we're still gathering. Yes? So, the follow up question is if you've had that slide on English as a second language. Yep. Um, what was the basis of that metric? Um, we did, we just. I mean, does it, is, it, is, it, is 
a misunderstanding because they're just not as good understanding the, the it, language. The, the, the concept or, of it was genetics is a language onto itself, the biologies of it, and so in certain cases <coughs> it's now a third language. Because if English is your second language, and now I'm writing in English and Latin and Greek and, and all of these other things, is that actually going to impact your ability to answer this question? Not that you can't think through the process, but maybe the language of it. So the reason we included that one in is because we have kind of a battery of uh, demographic data that is like your year in school, first generation status, and all of that. And I just pulled that one in, and I tested um, the spring 18 data against each of those demographics, and none of them had any difference, except there was like a 0 0.05 or 0 0.04. It wasn't even that big of a difference. Like, I could see it, where that would make a difference. It, it, well, and it did. So it, 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 it I reversed the situation and think of another language as my second language, that time of the other language, mm -hmm. Chinese, for instance. Yeah, I, it, it would make a difference for me. Yeah, I, so I could do it. And it, and it did make a difference. So how do we... Address that? Yeah. Well, it's going to get written up in the paper, and it will be a caveat when they're interpreting data to say, you know, if you have a, a class that has a lot of students that are second language English speakers, then you need to take the, whatever data you're gathering with that grain of salt, because we've shown that there is a statistical difference there. Yes, there was a, a small article recently in Nature or science or something that said that they had data that when Central South American populations were taught in their own language, they really came up. Right. You know, versus That's just the second language. That does not surprise me in the least. I, mean, there's, I think the point was this whole population is being under drawn upon mm -hmm. because there's nobody teaching them in their native language. And some of these were indigenous languages. Wow. Which is so quite weighty. Sorry. Yeah, that'd be hard to do. But yeah, and this data supports your, your assumption there that it is it, it is impactful, that there there is a difference in how they're answering, even if it's... I should it, try to find that for you. It'd be interesting. So. I can't remember All right, I think we're like two minutes over, um, but I'm up for questions. All right. Anybody wants to see the completed concept in the story I have here?